but actually were the Four Noble Truths that were unearthed by the Buddha. And these truths are much more than you would suspect. They are useful tools as we go upon our own quest for a solution for suffering. So first of all, they are a summary of the Buddha Dhamma. Most people are exposed to this. Most people come up to you and say, what is your religion? I'm Buddhist. What is Buddhism? You say the Four Noble Truths to them. A lot of people just do that. Now, the next one, the second one, they were Buddha's steps in his investigation for meditation, using his meditation. They were the investigation steps that you can you can actually repeat that same exact investigation. Number three, they're a teaching method for the lesson construction, for the construction of his verbal lessons that he was giving. They can be used uh, also for you to build talks with the same kind of very effective uh, construction when you're talking about anything in Buddhism. If you take almost any of the subject, and you move back to the Four Noble Truths and set it up that way to present to a person reflecting on whatever your subject is about in reference to the Four Noble Truths, then it's very effective to, to present it to somebody. The fourth one is they are a communication and reconciliation um, plan. And instead of reconciliation, I would almost say, I was thinking about this, let's, let's, Let's go here and see if I can actually do this. I was going to use a different word in here. and I was going to say arbitration. Because in the text, we find this arbitration is preserved in reference to military incidents and uh, political incidents that are happening with the, uh, with the uh, kings between the different kingdoms and everything. That's where it shows up. And then if you can think uh, of more uses for the Four Noble Truths, you should send them to me. Let me know before we finally, finally <laughs> put this into a book form, which you've been saying for a few years, I think. But time gets away from you when you're a monastic. You kind of forget about time and it just sort of sails by. All right, so the first one we look at Four Noble Truths, summary of the Buddha Dhamma. And we've all heard this, there is suffering, there is a cause of suffering, there is a cessation of suffering, there is a path to the cessation of suffering. And this is a really simple summary of the Buddhist teaching based on Siddhartha Gautama's search and the quest results. So these sentences were designed the way they come out traditionally, were preserved this way. The sentences were designed to invite you and me to get more curious and repeat his discovery for ourselves. And they are not the original um, statements if they do not appear to be open-ended statements that invite inspection. So they need to have uh, an invitation. If you want to ask a question about that, I'm trying to do this fast enough so you can have some questions. But what am I talking about is like when you make a statement, there's different kinds. And this kind, well, the way it's stated here, leaves it open for somebody to go find out, you know, what suffering is or what the cause of it is or what the cessation of it is. And whether there is a path to the extended cessation of the suffering. The second way, uh, the truths, the Buddhist steps for investigation, they were his steps for investigation. Uh, for meditation. So as you practice your meditation, um, as a meditator, it is, it is possible to repeat the steps of the Buddha's own investigation path. We have lots of information about that throughout the text in different suttas. Um, these four questions were asked by him in his meditation, each time inviting inspection. It kept inviting him to keep going. They directed him to define uh, how to, to define suffering, its cause, its cessation, and the development of a path to that cessation that he would later teach others. 
So the question Q asks the question, so how did the Buddha figure out the cause of this suffering? And the answer is he first investigated through deductive reasoning how suffering happens in human beings. And this was before he saw the, um, the answer for himself. And he, through de, you, you know, deductive reasoning, we have a good preservation of how he figured it out uh, first before he saw it in the Samyutta Nikaya and the Nidhanavaga in book number 12, Sutta number 10, with the 10 in parentheses, um, the origination. You go to the origination. It's on page 537 in Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, the Majima Nikaya. He also, def I'm sorry, translation of the Samyutta Nikaya. He also defined it in the Majima Nikaya um, via the Satchivibhanga Sutta, uh, Majima Nikaya number 140, number 10. Okay, and that, that, um, you know, that sutta, along with the Four Noble Truths, we should not forget to also check out the Samaditi Sutta number nine. And that looks like a big, big thing there, but what it is from 13 verses 13 through 71, <laughs> but it's not that really long. It's in, it's enjoyable reading. What it does is it, it defines more clearly the Four Noble Truths first, it takes each of the 12 links of dependent origination and it defines them. Now, to say something to say about that is that whenever you're talking about the, uh, the Four Noble Truths, you are talking about dependent origination. And whenever you're talking about dependent origination, you're talking about the Four Noble Truths. And you have to gradually figure out how a subject group that you're discussing in Buddhism is reflecting the Four Noble Truths is almost always happening. You just have to think about it when I'm talking about this or I'm talking about that. How is this reflecting the Four Noble Truths? And see if you can find it. It's kind of fun. Okay, reviewing how uh, the, this suit to the Samaditi reviews how to completely establish right view, which is, um, let's see. Oops, let's see. I want to put this as... Um, which is the impersonal perspective, not to explaining the Four Noble Truths and all 12 links of dependent origination. So it's all, this is now what you're, what you're getting into here is like, you feel like maybe you should go out and buy a loom. <laughs> and put it in your living room for weaving all of this stuff together. Because now, as we get into these, uh, the, the uh, foundation pieces, you begin to really understand them. You have to understand they were not separate gardens in different towns that people were growing, okay? <laughs> Where they were competing to grow big vegetables or something. It wasn't like that. It was a weaving of a Dhamma cloth or a Dhamma tapestry, a beautiful tapestry that was beautiful symmetry, beautiful colors, very balanced in the design and pattern of it. And all of these pieces that we cover when we're talking about things are actually part of this tapestry. And I'm not sure if as long as I live, maybe when I die or something, I don't know if I'll ever be able to actually design this tapestry. I've tried to draw it a number of times in different to see if I could build a quilt or something that had all the pieces on it, <laughs> you know, but they're not just pieces all over the place. It truly was a puzzle that was put together with all these pieces combined or woven, interwoven with each other. When he began teaching others, he, he started to note the simile of the, the doctor. This is how it started to come up. And you just stop for a moment. Just I want you to just close your eyes for a moment. Bring up in your mind's eye a doctor and his patient. And say to yourself, what does the doctor usually do when I get ill? So this patient goes to the doctor because he's sick 
and suffering and the doctor identifies, attempts to identify through an examination, the sickness by investigating the visible symptoms. And he sees that the patient is suffering in particular ways in parts of your body, the lungs or uh, the eyes, the ears, nose and throat, things like that. And he realizes there is suffering. It's the first thing that happens. Next thing is the doctor examines the patient further to find the root cause of the suffering in order to make a diagnosis. And the diagnosis is trying to pinpoint what exactly is going on, where is the cause of the suffering. So that's the second noble truth. And the doctor has, the third one is the, the doctor has previously studied anatomy and physiology and therefore he knows what a healthy person should look like and feel like. And this is what he's, he's his establishment of the description of cessation in his mind. And the fourth one is finally the doctor announces his prognosis. Um, after identifying the cause of the suffering, he advises the patient what's wrong and gives him the instructions to follow a treatment plan to return to good health. So there is a path to the cessation of suffering. And so the doctor um, simile became floating around everywhere. Everyone was using this at that time. And how, the Q says, how important is it to follow the instructions of a doctor? <laughs> Did he talk about that? The answer is, you go the references to the Sunakada Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya number 105, and you read sections 24 and 25 for an answer to get it clear, it becomes clearer to you. Now, this is a simile where a wounded man is struck by a poison arrow and he can only keep questioning in his mind while he's lying there, shot with this arrow. All he's concerned with is who did this? Why did they do this? Was there a reason from my past? Am I going to die? Am I going to live? Should I seek revenge? So all of these things uh, were unessential to him healing himself, not essential. They were unessential. And he couldn't stop thinking about unessential things long enough to heal his wound. So if the patient takes good care of himself, if he takes his medicine, eats his food, gets proper air, proper exercise, proper sleep, he will heal himself and become healthy again. It is the same for successful meditation. It is the same plan. You realize that you have a painful feeling and disturbing emotions are in your life. You learn how these work in your meditation. The proper meditation allows you to witness how things work very clearly, very clearly. It is not a shut box type of, 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 of closing your eyes. It's closing your eyes to watch how things arise from the smallest to the middle size, to the larger two experiences in your life, how they happen in the middle part and how they pass away. But you become curious and you begin to watch these six sense doors make contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual reactions, and you see the birth of the suffering and how the suffering operates and then suffer at the end with Lem sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. You see how it works. So we're talking about the salyatana, fasa, vedana, tanha, upadana, bhava, jati, dukkha, ajiva, etc. To mara, the death of the event, what's happening to you. So when you're learning how to watch events individually. A second noble truth, there is a cause of suffering. The Buddha examined very closely the cause of suffering that arises. To find the cause of the dis-ease that occurs in your mind and in your body. The question is, so how did the Buddha use the second noble truth in his investigation? At first, 
The answer is, he thought that arising imperfections were causing suffering to his mind and body. He watched how both unwholesome and wholesome arising states occurred in the very same way. He began noticing he was shifting his attention to the imperfections. Each time, his attitude towards these distractions was getting more personal. And as he continues practice, he finds that as suffering, the dukkha is arising. One can decrease the degree of suffering if you practice an impersonal observation. Anatta, applying that, applying right effort, sama vayama correctly, an immediate degree of relief will occur when you see things more clearly in any situation. Even if you're in a frightening situation, everyone else around you is terrified, if you can manage to see calm enough what is actually going on, there's something you can possibly do to help people around you and to yourself. When we practice TWIM, we are using both the two components of serenity, samatha to calm down, and insight, vipassana, to see new knowledge arise. It is implied in the text that these two were originally yoked evenly together, side by side, during observation in your meditation. The master taught this way so we could experience direct knowledge and have undisputed, clear comprehension for ourselves. In 149.10, section 10, these two components are yoked evenly together. So the first noble truth was investigated by the Buddha to confirm there really is bodily and mental suffering that exists for human beings and to watch it arise and pass away. Anicca. And the Buddha watched this as deeply as he could. He observed it for longer and longer periods of time to see if there were different ways that things arise and disappear, or if they all arose and passed away in the same way. He began to understand that all suffering impersonally arises and passes away in the same symptomatic way, increasing tension as it arrives, as the craving as it's coming up, and feeling it fade away as it passes away into another event. He then moved on to the third noble truth to determine if there was a way to reach a cessation of this painful condition. In the third noble truth, there is cessation of suffering. The Buddha realized all people, all people experience temporary cessations of suffering during life. And he wondered, he wondered if this could happen for longer periods of time or whether it was always impermanent. He realized a state of cessation of suffering feels like the absence of all tension and tightness that was involved with the arising suffering. At first, he assumed that he would have to force the suffering to stop in order to build up a state of no suffering. That's the way he thought about it. But this was not the case. Later, he discovers an approach of withdrawing his attention off of the suffering distraction by quietly continuing his observation, mindfulness. And it is that idea that he finally confirms is correct, which leads him to experience a liberation of mind, the Nibbana. There's a note here that you may review this moment of discovery by beginning by reading in Majima Nikai number 36, sections 31 and 32, where his, that's where he first realizes in 
in Sutta number 36, the Mahasachika Sutta, uh, that he was practicing the wrong way before and he needs to change it. He needs to change, it, lighten up the concentration so that he could be able to watch inside what was happening. And this recollection leads to a Siddhartha changing his approach uh, to directions in his meditation and he proceeds from there. Now this change was so successful that later on he realizes that surely it could be beneficial for any common man or woman to learn how to reduce their levels of suffering in daily life as a routine practice. And this is true even though they may not fully commit to reaching this liberation of mind, Nibbana, the, the supermane Nibbana, even if they didn't go this far. This being true, thousands came to listen and, and listen to the Buddhist teachings. And it's our position at DSMC that uh, those early lay disciples of the Buddha at that time, they began to teach a simple daily practice in life, which came from some small changes in the definitions of the last three folds of the Eightfold Path. And the last three folds are obviously, we covered the Eightfold Path last week, so you remember that obviously they're supporting your meditation practice, six, seven, and eight, the three, the three last folds. Harmonious effort, purification, and retraining of mind. Harmonious mindfulness, specific observation, skill, and harmonious concentration defined as lighter form, productive without tension. Once the meaning of these folds is refined in your mind and applied correctly, a whole new world of investigation opens up for you. And it becomes obvious that these three folds had to be understood clearly in order to operate correctly. So within the twim teaching, we say harmonious instead of right before the name of each fold in the eightfold path. And the purpose of your practice is to bring about smooth operation of the mind in everyday life and harmony to the world around you. We believe that the tranquil wisdom insight meditation practice we are teaching is quite possibly the core practice that was taught by the Buddha in early times, along with several other supporting practices, filling in various needs for a variety of people. And examples were the breathing meditations, forgiveness meditations, auditory, um, the auditory practices like the single word chanting like, oh, or the chanting and various practices of the yoga, okay? And there is no question that the correct meaning of right effort leads a person to relief from suffering in daily life today. These five tiny steps and their repetition in TWIM fulfill the four steps that are mentioned within the texts that are describing right effort, also called right striving, when it becomes automatic. You should compare the two side by side. There will be another lesson pertaining to right effort and, and twim separately from this one. Fourth noble truth, there is a path uh, to the cessation of suffering. We needed a path leap, so we'll take away the eye. <laughs> okay, if you do this practice cycle enough times that we teach you in twim, in exactly the same way, that is key. You will always be retraining your brain to make a change. And you are, will also find yourself unconsciously completing the entire Eightfold Path as you continue to build up the strength of your practice. And eventually mind discovers how much more comfortable and profitable this practice is in our life. It can suddenly make a decision on its own to perform all the steps automatically, whether whenever uh, it senses the symptoms of craving begin to arise again. And this happens, it does happen. We've had several students tell us about this and it has happened to many of us. 
we only call twin practice the six R's because in English, all the steps begin with R. <laughs> Okay, whenever you perform right effort correctly, you are witnessing all four noble truths. By one, you are witnessing suffering, and two, releasing craving and clinging, and three, experiencing a cessation of craving and suffering. And four, as you continue to replace suffering with a smile, and you continue to bring up more wholesome mind states and keep them going, staying on your meditation object longer is the most wholesome thing of all that you can do when you're coming back to a wholesome part. Essentially, you are also fulfilling the entire Eightfold Path, replacing suffering with a smile. Twim six steps are here. And here is Twim to recognize whenever the tension is rising during your meditation practice or in life. To release attention off any distraction, let go of it. Anything that has caught your attention, relax your mind and your head, especially of any leftover tension. As you relax, you might have a little bit of air just go out that you were holding on to that's left in there. It'll just go ah, like that, sort of. Return to your object of meditation and continue on using uplifted observation without tension and repeat the cycle only when you feel tension and tightness pulling mind's attention away. This is the sum total of right effort, sensing an unwholesome mind state, releasing the unwholesome mind state, bringing up a wholesome mind state, the smile, continue to bring up the wholesome mind states to support meditation, repeat the cycle whenever needed. That's it. That's the biggest problem for TWIM that we have. It's too simple. It's really funny. And it works. This is how you experience cessation of suffering as you continue purifying and retraining the mind in each cycle you practice. So fourth noble truth, the path to cessation of suffering. There are a few ways to present the, the Eightfold Path, but most of us know about the one that is a guide for life. And this is important and it will be covered in another lesson. But there's also the path that directly supports meditation to succeed. And there is a version where even one smile can fulfill your responsibility to smile, uh, to work on the entire Eightfold Path each day. I only want to present here how important your smile is. And if you believe you don't have any time to work on fulfillment of your Eightfold Path. It seems overwhelming. You just need to reconsider a moment because you can complete the path each day and imprint it into your mind by doing one thing, smiling. Smile and then give that smile away to someone else who needs it. And that's, you're completing the whole entire Eightfold Path as you do that.